Now, I want to talk about something different here, and it's something that it seems very obscure, again. But the um, um, simple fact is that it's not only extremely important, but that it's reflective of our present situation here. I want to talk about the Armenia's defeat in the Nagorno-Karabakh War. I call it the body count of the color revolution. I think you'll be surprised. The connections between the ridiculous prime minister of Armenia, uh, Nikol Pashinyan, a man who was installed by the ruling class, the global ruling class in 2018, after the color revolution there, a man who is extremely unpopular, extremely ignorant, completely uneducated, and yet they thrust this halfwit into power for the sake of making war on Russia and Iran. I've been saying for many years that Armenia is an extremely important country, despite only having three million people. But in addition to all that, Nagorno-Karabakh is this small region. It is actually in Azerbaijan, but it has a majority of Armenians. This has recently been captured by Azerbaijan and will be turned into an Islamic state. So you're going to see um, genocide coming very soon in what is a Monophysite um, Christian, very brave, very strong enclave, surrounded by Islam. I want you to pay attention to what happens in this region, the NKR, because it is a miniaturized version of our situation. Many of you may have heard of Nagorno-Karabakh, I'll simply call it NKR here, because in the early 90s, when the Soviet Union fell apart, this is one of the first major ethnic conflicts that um, that developed, that actually did make front page news briefly. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh has been around a very long time, always roughly 90% Armenian. Um, and when the revolution, the Soviet revolution took place, the Soviets adopted a policy where they encouraged so-called national republics. And these administrative borders had no relation to, um, to the ethnic, uh, makeup of the area. It is a traditionally Armenian, um, region going back to the ninth century. Nagorno Karabakh became part of the Russian Empire in 1805. Um, the point, of course, to protect it from the Muslims and Jews that surrounded it. The Soviets created Transcaucasia. This was a single state, but completely dependent, uh, that incorporated Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia in one, in one state, which was, of course, a disaster, as all those experiments are. The Soviets gave um, the NKR to Azerbaijan, despite being a completely Christian Armenian area, with some kind of autonomy. The 1926 census had... Uh, 89.2% of the NKR being Armenian, the Muslims making up the remainder. The Soviets, and of course the Azeris, uh, are Islamic, more or less secular Islamic. Um, the Soviets encouraged resettlement. This kind of forced immigration to upset the balance of the area and bring it under Soviet rule. Even by 1989, it became 77% Armenian. Because you have an Armenian region within and Azerbaijani state, but it is connected with Armenia proper. It's in a very disastrous position. You had constant border clashes, um, starting really in, in, in 1967. This is not, this is not an ancient divide. Of course, Armenians and Muslims were at war. That's why the Armenian kingdom came into existence in the first place. Um, and of course, Armenian Muslim hostility is always going to be there. Um, but of course, Stalin incorporated this area into Azerbaijan and where he was the Soviet Commissar of Nationalities. And that error is the root of the present war here. So for those of you who don't know, we're talking about the um, Caucasian Mountains, a Islamic state, which within it, more or less, contains an Armenian enclave. Um, by 1988, um, there was a drive for the Armenians to leave Azerbaijan, but they were refused. And in 1991, Soviets used soldiers um, to suppress an Armenian uh, Karabakh. After the collapse of the USSR, it became a de facto part of Armenia. Um, it was never recognized by anybody, but it was recognized by um, the region's powers just de facto. Um, and this is also um, essential to what we know as the Armenian Genocide. In 1920, the treaty uh, between the Turkish government and the Entente transferred territories occupied by the Turks to Greece, Armenia, and Georgia. And they also created an independent Kurdistan back then. The treaty was ultimately rejected by Lenin. Two years prior, he had signed the Brest Treaty uh, with with Turkey. So Turkey was not only granted the territories of Western Armenia, um, 
but areas inhabited by Christian Georgians um, as well. These have been liberated from Islamic control, the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878. Um, they dissolved all, all ethnic Armenian units, the volunteer uh, squadrons, and they created these destructive concessions were confirmed in 1921. Don't forget, Lenin supported um, Kemal Ataturk, the Masonic uh, Turkish leader. Uh, 10 million gold rubles, in fact, Lenin transferred uh, to his movement. So Ataturk was able to retake uh, the same liber formerly liberated territories, defeated the Greek army, um, which was heading towards Ankara, the capital of Turkey. Turkey was on its last legs, yet again supported by artificially by the great powers, in this case, Lenin. The Turkish state would have collapsed yet again. But once the Russians pulled out, the Greeks were defeated, and the Turkish terror against the Greek and Armenian population began. And that is the origin of the genocide. Therefore, what we're talking about here is connected to this genocide. Since 1988, there's been a series of wars between Islamic Azerbaijan, supported usually by the USA and Israel, which is a whole separate topic, and Armenia, supported by Russia. Um, usually, Armenia won. That's changed. The war we're talking about was from September 27th to November 10th of last year and was a defeat for the first time. Now, Azerbaijan has captured large parts of the NKR. Um, you had a month and a half of some nasty warfare. A Russian helicopter was shot down, um, and finally, a peace treaty was signed. Um, so, there's a Russian peacekeeping force there, 2,000 strong, uh, and now you have essentially a Turkish military um, enclave in the Caucasus Mountains, which is very much now a part of the imperial Turkish foreign policy. Azerbaijan was armed by Israel. Uh, Azerbaijan is a major Israeli client state, and it's an area where Turkey and Israel, as well as uh, the EU, are supporting this oil-rich Islamic state. Um, this is the first time in a while this is a full Azerbaijani invasion. Rivalry between Russia and Turkey is a big part of this. And I mentioned that it's oil rich, and now you have pipelines, both of oil and natural gas, which were put in danger by this fighting. Much of the local economy is based on this. Um, Gazprom Armenia, part of the state-owned uh, Russian uh, natural uh, gas um, organization, reported damage to its pipelines. Part of this war has to do with destroying the Russian infrastructure in the area. Um, when the recent clashes, the invasion began, Erdogan, of the president of Turkey, stated that Turkey will never hesitate to stand against any attack on the rights and lands of Azerbaijan. Uh, the Turks accused Moscow of encouraging Armenia. Of course, there's no evidence for this. Armenia has absolutely no ability to attack anyone, especially since there's been a massive buildup of the Azeri military very suddenly. Azerbaijan has 10 million people, uh, oil, uh, wealth. The last few years, you've had a massive rearmament of the country. And Russia, unfortunately, has sold about $4 billion worth of weapons. But Israel, about $2 billion. And the U.S. Uh, is in third place there. The whole point was to attack the NKR. Um, Azerbaijan is trying to even the score. They've lost several wars in the past. From 2004 to 2014, Azerbaijan increased its military spending 20 times. The NKR has a population of 150,000 with a small but extremely motivated and very patriotic military force. It's almost like a, an Armenian um, Montenegro. The relations between um, Zionism and Azerbaijan has always been very close. Turkey and Israel were the first two states to recognize the independence of the country from the Soviet Union. Um, there's a U.S. State Department cable where the president of Azerbaijan, um, Aliyev, stated that the relations between the two countries, and this is a quote here, nine-tenths of it are below the surface, meaning that it's secret and it has to do with Zionist foreign policy. The American Jewish Congress uh, visited the area in 2010 with Hillary Clinton. David Harris made it very clear how important this country is to Zionism, and the same thing occurred in 2017 with John Shapiro. The American Jewish Congress, connected with the State Department and the Israeli regime, have stated over and over again that Azerbaijan is essential to Israeli foreign policy. The U.S. has actually been concerned with this. Israel has bought several air bases in Azerbaijan, which sits on, of course, Iran's northern border. Israel actually bought a major airfield. In fact, the State Department uh, informally 
So had they, the Israelis have bought an airfield in that part of the world. The airfield is called Azerbaijan. It's a massive military expansion of the Zionists that very few people are, are discussing. Um, this has uh, also created a strain with Turkey, uh, and they're very worried about the possibility of a war with Iran. Any Israeli war with Iran is going to have Azerbaijan as its most important ally and its uh, defense um, buttress, so to speak, to the north. Um, the Israeli arms manufacturer, uh, Elbit Systems, contracted with uh, Georgia's uh, Tbilisi Aerospace to upgrade a, a new, a new uh, uh, air support fighter, the uh, Su-25 Scorpion. Azerbaijan was the main um, purchaser of this. Um, the Texgar uh, reconnaissance satellite system is built by Israel in Azerbaijan. And the Namur Infantry Fighting Vehicle also created. The Israelis essentially bought Azerbaijani, um, the military industrial complex. They built up the Baku International Airport. Uh, they're even providing security for Aziri, um, for, for Azerbaijan's president on foreign visits. They share intelligence with each other. And of course, the main concern is war with Iran. Azerbaijan is going to be an essential part of this. So this recent war, um, so back in 2009, um, Aeronautics Defense Systems, Israeli company, is building factories in Baku, which now um, is um, is fully operational. Um, Israel's Defense Department is extremely close to the military-industrial complex in, in that part of the world. Um, so this recent war, Azerbaijan's 2020, uh, to take the NKR is part of this very broad plan. Now, the energy aspect of this is the Caspian Sea huge oil and gas reserves that the West and the Israelis want to see imported to Western Europe, point being to cut Russia out of the out of the deal. Um, the northern routes through through Russia don't satisfy uh, any long term hopes of, you know, their alleged dependence on, on Moscow. Uh, and the EU has been very angry at their dependence on Russian sources of gas. Um, but all of this comes down to war against Russia. The EU will defend its pipelines bringing Caspian oil to the Caucasus. Um, but investing in this infrastructure doesn't um, um, doesn't make sense unless there's stability to the area. This recent war may have made that possible by almost eliminating um, the region of um, the NKR. These oil and gas lines are extremely important to the area, and they dovetail perfectly with Zionist foreign policy. Um, Israel, in fact, a lot of its energy needs are, are fed the pipeline that goes from Baku to uh, Sehan and, and Turkey's eastern Mediterranean coast. Now it's not that important because the the market is oversaturated. But the EU um, right now gets about 35 to 40 percent of its oil and gas from from Russia. The so-called Southern Gas Corridor strategy, which comes from the EU and NATO as well as Israel, building non-Russian supplies coming from the Caspian area. Um, Armenia, don't forget, is part of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And it stands in the way of Zionist expansion. But even people like Brzezinski in his Grand Chessboard, uh, actually you talked about NATO's expansion in Turkish area and building up these pan-Turkism of the post-Soviet uh, Caucasus in Central Asia. Um, Azerbaijan from the very beginning was a Western power base. In 1993, the CIA, uh, overthrew, um, the government there, which actually had been elected in some way and brought to power, um, Aliyev the father of the current president. So the entire post-Soviet uh, uh, rule of, of that country is is in one family. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh has been Christian for millennia, and to invade the area and make it into a secular Islamic and Zionist region is very important. The t- pipelines are too close to it, and it also was a source of instability. But even Armenia, after the color revolution in 2018, has come into the Western orbit. This is a so-called velvet revolution, openly financed by Soros in the CIA and in the major banks, overthrew the Armenian government and installed um, Nikol Pashinyan, who, as I've said before, is utterly contemptible. Of course, he immediately signed the um, European Union Association Agreement, which is odd because Armenia is part of the Russian Eurasian Economic Union. There's now fighting going on, especially since the war was lost, over which direction this, this strategic country is going to take. But since the war was lost, November of last year, the country erupted in riots, including the storming of the Capitol Parliament building. The surrender was premature. The war was launched deliberately and lost deliberately by Pashinyan as an agent of Soros, of Zionism, of the CIA. 
probably majority of the country believes that the prime minister is working with the EU and NATO and deliberately lost the war. Um, Georgia itself, as we all know, was taken by the CIA Soros color revolution of 2003. And Mikhail Sassavili, as well as uh, Pashinyan, are both interesting because they're both very mentally unstable. None of these people are popular or even remotely legitimate. Russia is Armenia's lifeline. It's by far their main trading partner. Its infrastructure comes from Russia. To try to separate it from there and attach it to Turkey, Israel, and Western Europe would be to reduce it to fourth world status, since Armenia produces nothing that the West needs. Um, Pashinyan was part of the Armenian National Congress for a long time. Most of the time, Pashinyan simply led violent revolts organized by the Open Society Foundation against successive Armenian governments. That's pretty much all he ever does. Pashinyan's party, um, of course, supports full privatization, um, full, full free ta- trade, joining the EU, all the typical liberal, um, liberal um, agenda. It is the full program of oligarchy here. Um, just before the war, of course, his party members were meeting with the American ambassador. But the thing about Pashinyan is that he um, was extremely unpopular. His party didn't win a single seat in the National Assembly, not until 2012. In 2007, he received 1.7% of the vote in the presidential race. His existence is entirely artificial. There was actually a group that he was a part of, uh, headed called the Way Out Alliance. In 2017, they received almost 8% of the vote. And in fact, he promised citizens of the capital um, 10,000 Armenian drums if they voted for him. He's literally, openly uh, trying to um, bribe voters into into um, voting for him. Anytime he's lost an election, he's hardly got any more than 5% of the vote. He claims the election is rigged and usually goes and hides in the American embassy. Um, that Pashinyan is one of the most violent and radical of the liberal uh, Soros uh, factions in the area. Somehow, though, despite getting several prison sentences for election-related violence, is now prime minister solely because he was Soros's hand-picked Velvet Revolution leader. You study his career, and the man has done nothing but lead one revolt after another. He has no clear source of income, um, and so by installing him, despite again getting you know five percent of the vote in various elections, um, he was simply installed in power. Um, and even 2018, when he first came to power, he supported giving. Azerbaijan pieces of, of Christian territory. The minute he was leading revolts, he became a so-called hardliner. He just told his audience what they wanted to hear. Um, but it's a big deal to say that this hand-picked prime minister deliberately led the country into a defeat. Um, then suddenly, once he's installed as prime minister, somehow the claim is now his popularity rating is 98%. So a guy who got 1.7% of the vote a decade ago now is at 98%. Now that Armenia has lost the war over the NKR, and because of this man, the country is now on the verge of civil war. The NGOs controlled this process from top to bottom. Um, of course, it's nonsense. Armenia did not attack it. This was a Zionist-led, uh, just like in the Georgian War in 2008, it was a Zionist-led movement, the invasion to finally take over the Christian regions of, of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, but the confidence that Azerbaijan now has from Turkey and this massive buildup in the, in the military is part of the reason why this occurred. Um, so, um, our Armenia, of course, ally of the Russia, but because of Pashinyan, the, um, relations between, uh, Russia and Armenia have decayed. In fact, the policy of the government is to pull away from Russia, which of course was a kiss of death as far as any military, um, was concerned. He's carrying out EU and NATO orders. He refused to prepare for what he knew was this massive coming invasion. Um, intelligence assets, of course, were essential, and Pashinyan deliberately destroyed the intelligence service. Um, even, you know, the, even the artillery, which we, you need reconnaissance for that, of course, Armenia simply didn't have. All of this had been uh, dismantled, despite seeing a massive military buildup by the Muslims. Um, they simply had no idea of, of any target mapping. The entire Armenian Defense Department is based around target mapping uh, against the Azeri population, and yet they completely failed in every regard. They were totally unprepared. Pashinyan was installed by Soros. He deliberately promoted incompetence and political appointees. Um, Again, Armenia is a militarized state. They have conscription. They're surrounded by um, a violent Islam. But since the so-called Velvet Revolution a few years ago, four heads of the National Security Service Three chiefs of the general staff, 
and three commanders of the Katabak Defense Army were replaced. The very same people who won previous wars were all fired from their posts. In fact, three additional intelligence leaders were replaced. And one of the men who replaced them had zero competence, had no idea what, what intelligence even was. And the Russian media says the same. And all of a sudden, you had violently anti-Russian rhetoric from, um, you know, Voice of America and all the CIA publications and Soros publications. You had a complete decimation of the Armenian uh, military brass, and for no good reason. One of them was was uh, dismissed because um, in, in a general's uh, wedding, a daughter's wedding, um, they weren't following COVID regulations. Someone didn't have a mask on, so they removed. Uh, him from his position. So a- any silly reason. The point is, Pashinyan was installed by NATO and the Zionists to dismantle Armenian defenses and so to facilitate a massive Islamic invasion in 2020 to completely take over the area. You know, even in the summer of 2020, you had small arms fire going on all the time. But since the Velvet Revolution 2018, there was absolutely no response to any of this. The Aziris were building elite shock corps an invading force. They weren't even hiding it. They were building warehouses at the front line, a fuel system. You could see this with binoculars. You didn't even need reconnaissance. And yet Armenia did absolutely nothing. Dismantling the um, top brass um, was deliberate. There was no good reason for this. The point was to put the military in utter chaos. Um, the drones that the Israelis were building in their new factories were a big part of this war. Um, it was a huge part of it, in fact, and Armenia had no way of um, uh, responding to it. And on top of all this, Pashinyan had the military deliberately cut its ties with Moscow, which is proof that Pashinyan was in league with Armenia's enemies. He curtailed all of these, especially intelligence uh, contacts. So this is what happens when the regime installs your prime minister, and the prime minister then decimates the entire country's defenses. And typical for these people, the narcissistic mind, People like Pashinyan have, they blame Russia for the loss. Um, it was very, very clear that the um, deaths and the defeat of this 2020 war, which led to the overrunning of this Christian enclave in Azerbaijan, was deliberate. Um, I mean, these guys didn't even have a mobilization plan. Um, just the most poor, awful um, semi-organization without any real, um, without any serious uh, uh, defensive posture at all. And on top of all this, about 8,000 Muslim fundamentalists were bussed in by Turkey to continue to fight alongside the massive um, Azeri army. Uh, Turkey sent um, F-16s to assist Azerbaijan. In addition to all of this, the supplies, everything, the, you know, the Azeris were very well fortified. And, of course, um, recently, Erdogan has engaged in a Islamic or at least pan-Turkic imperial foreign policy. This is not against NATO. This is from NATO. Turkey operates with the blessing of the West and serves its interests. Turkey's economy, of course, has crashed uh, at least a loss of 10% last year, if not more. And what Erdogan did, and they had been in a depression prior to that, the imperial foreign policy is a way to gain some lost ground. They can pretend they're a renegade in NATO when, in fact, they're doing exactly what they're meant to do. Um, so the point of it all, as it comes down, and this, the destruction of, of this entire enclave is to make a war on Russia, to take over the um, oil and gas uh, assets in the region, to destroy vehemently, I mean, to genocide a small Christian enclave, which, of course, is a very ancient one, to humiliate Armenia, to destroy the corridor that takes Iran to Armenia to Russia, which is extremely important, to break that alliance and to permit Azerbaijan to be the northern base when the war with Iran comes, and I think we all know that's going to be a top priority for this ridiculous administration. Keep in mind, I know many of you know this already, but Biden isn't capable of any kind of policy. Half the time, as you may have seen recently, he doesn't know where he is. They're keeping him away from the public. So any policy that comes from that administration, he will have absolutely nothing to do with. They're treating this Kamala Harris as you know a presidential force in her own right. What shocks me about all of this, and this is closely connected because the war with Iran is coming, the Israeli uh, bases in, in Azerbaijan are extremely important to this, both for uh, military, uh, fuel, and, and intelligence. This is essential here. Um, the Zionists have completely colonized Azerbaijan. And of course, 
to maintain some kind of stability, they needed conquest and they needed Israeli arms and the massive uh, Turkish presence to overrun um, the Armenian Christian movement. The Gono Karabakh is small, of course, but extremely militant. They're very much like a Montenegro. Even Armenia itself, surrounded by violent Islamic and Jewish power. The classic um, remnants of the Khazar Empire are still present. Um, and ultimately, the, the peace deal permitted most of the NKR to go to the Muslims, and like everything else, is being divided up by uh, Jewish financiers. Um, Putin helped build the peace deal. It's unifying the area, and I mentioned this um, Transcaucasian Soviet Republic, Transcaucasia, which brought all of these Caucasian ethnicities together under one roof, under Soviet domination. To some extent, a mini version of that is happening here. Um, and I think the ultimate drive is to remove Armenia entirely from the area, or render her so small as to be completely harmless, and to see some variation of the um, Armenian genocide. And it is going to happen in the NKR. The only thing saving them right now is 2,000 Russian soldiers that um, protects the Lakin Corridor, and that connects the Republic of Armenia to Armenia-held areas of the NKR. The Turkish military also has a observation point across the line of contact, like almost like it does in Syria. And um, one of the one of the possibilities here, and I think this is almost certain, is revolt against Pashinyan is going to be a revolt against liberalism, a NATO, and Westernization. Um, some of you may have heard of NATO's uh, homosexual, uh, sorry, the, uh, NATO's Day Against Transphobia and Homophobia, which they celebrate every year. If you've read their materials, this is NATO we're talking about here. Sometimes I still have trouble dealing with the fact that um, uh, this is somehow a military alliance. In my book, An America's Failure in um, the Islamic World, a book I keep forgetting about, um, I heard it's pretty good. I go into some detail. This is, you know, five, six years ago, some detail as the ideological motivation within NATO itself. Concerning the inauguration, this is very similar in that we're seeing a purging of the National Guard and possibly the regular infantry there, a purging of them based on ideology. So they're creating a, a um, they're creating the precedent for purging any um, locally based military force of any right wing interest. I said before that Obama led a massive purge of the top brass. Um, near his last year of his presidency, to remove any possibility of nationalist military officers from the rank of colonel on up. Donald Trump um, tried to rectify that for a very short period of time last year when he removed the, um, when he removed the, um, his, his defense uh, secretary. But you notice the exact same phenomenon is happening. The color revolution takes over in Armenia. They immediately begin introducing chaos, completely really dismantling the military intelligence and the um, the defense of the NKR. Remember how many, you know, a millennia these people stood against Islamic and Zionist violence. Their entire cultural world is based on this militant response to Islam and the rem remnants of Khazadia. But unfortunately for them, um, the um, in investment in the oil and gas infrastructure, as well as the building of a huge uh, Israeli military base in that part of the world to look at, not only to monitor Russia, but to act as the staging ground for anti-Iranian um, military action, which I think is coming soon. The purging of the American brass, the purging of the Armenian brass uh, was purely ideological. It was to introduce chaos and a possib possible uh, invasion uh, of Iran. Maybe the very same reason this is happening. Armenia may be small, but it is significant. It's highly literate, and it's one of the most ethno-nationalist areas of the world. There's one group of people that can challenge um, um, the Talmudist Jews in their cohesiveness, it is the Armenians. So as we've seen before, everything comes together. The color revolution, the complete theft of all elections, and the installation of people who... The Pashinyan is, 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 is even worse than Biden because this man had almost zero support. I think the most he ever got was 5% uh, a few years ago. In the presidential race, as I mentioned, uh, in 2008, he received 1.7% of the vote. This is the man that they've installed, as if to say, we could do what we want, what are you going to do about it? And then he immediately begins to dismantle the military system and all other forms of all kinds of, you know, ethno-nationalist institutions, everything that Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh developed to, to, to protect immediately. 
um, dismantled the whole thing. Uh, and again, you have a very similar situation in the U.S. and possibly for the same reason. Pashinyan is uneducated. He has no real knowledge of, of politics. His entire world, his entire life is based around leading these street protests with no clear source of income against any ethno-nationalist uh, Armenian state. I mean, he's clearly CAA, Open Society Foundation, all the rest of it. There's no doubt about this, and he hasn't even hid that. The, the NGOs financed by Western capital are um, essentially running the state. And once the war was lost last November, you had a massive uprising in the country. So what we're looking at here is the possibility of serious genocide, a repeat of the Armenian genocide, um, and the building of the old Soviet uh, Transcaucasian uh, Republic, the possibility of major military action, both against Russia on the one hand and certainly Iran on the other. Iran has always been an ally of the uh, nationalist movement worldwide, and it's a huge target for the regime. All of this is being done um, in the face of any, you know, basic legality. What's happening in the installation of this poor soul Joe Biden? I'll tell you, if he wasn't a wasn't a pedophile, I would be absolutely um, uh, uh, pitiful. I mean, I really feel sorry for the guy. I don't, but if he were a normal guy, it would be it would definitely be a problem. You know, this is this is elder abuse. He doesn't know where he is, and it's so blatant. They're not trying to hide this. They're not trying to hide the theft of the election. Um, now, as you are listening to this, I have no idea. This there, there could be something huge going on as I'm as I'm saying this, as I'm speaking. Are you hearing this? Uh, of course, this is hours before you you actually will hear it. Um, so I don't quite know. This is actually 6:20 a.m. as I'm uttering these words, and I can't predict what might happen. Either a false flag or even a surprise from Donald Trump. No one denies that not only did Trump win these elections, he swept them. He absolutely dominated. And I've been through all that on a, a broadcast um, a few weeks ago using a guy like Pashinyan in, in Armenia, you know, one, two percent of the vote, and he's the one they pick. That's a deliberate provocation. What the regime is going to do as it begins lashing out is starving, isolating, and destroying uh, all nationalist enclaves. It's an amazing parallel with what's happening in, um, in the Caucasus Mountains. And because this is very close to the heart of Khazaria, because the Israelis are a huge part of this movement, along with Turkey and NATO, uh, the rest of NATO in this part of the world, there's a definite connection. You notice that I talked about the colonization of Azerbaijan. It's the you know American Jewish Congress who went there. It's supposed to be a private organization, and yet they were the ones who went with Hillary Clinton a few years ago to um, to begin building the, the new infrastructure of the um, Azeri military. This is what people like Erdogan has been worrying about in building this Turkish empire from Mediterranean to Western China. And in every step of the way, the point is to uh, capture the press, fake elections, install whoever they need, and use the most violent force imaginable against anyone who says otherwise. I know um, that this topic has been obscure, but I'm kind of known for that. A long time ago, I did uh, two-part series, at least two-part series on Armenian history. They are, a, to say the least, a heroic people. A tiny little country in the mountains, very, very much like a Montenegro, surrounded but the remnants of the Khazar Empire, and um, yeah, there is a strong Jewish influence there um, to this day, and uh, the Islamic world. If it wasn't for their connection with Russia, they would have been wiped out years ago. It's a miracle that there's still Armenians left in the world. As most of you know, the Jewish connection with the Armenian genocide is substantial. They're going to be doing the same thing here. The parallels in what's happening in uh, Washington, D.C., versus what's happening in places like Karabakh and, 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 and Yerevan, Armenia, um, are striking, and they're no coincidence. There's no coincidences here. Um, and it's absolutely uh, shocking to see. But again, for those of us who've been following these things uh, for, for decades, we realize that there's no, no real surprise here. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.